April 1995, Louise Ellis, a writer and justice advocate, vanishes. Her yellow Jeep is found abandoned on the side of the road in the Gatineau Hills in Quebec. Police fear it's the last chapter in her life. Her common-law husband, Brett Morgan, is filled with dread. How are you feeling? Increasingly terror-filled. Marie Perrant, a private investigator in training, feels compelled to help find Louise. This was way above my head, but I was drawn to it. I couldn't, I couldn't let go. Following her instincts, Marie Perrant embarks on a journey into the heart of the crime. Her investigation goes so deep that police ask her help in finding the killer. I said to the detectives, I'll bring you the body back. I'll put it on a silver platter for you. We thought it was a pretty heavy claim to make for someone on her first assignment as a PI. On a sweltering July afternoon, Perrant confronts the horror of what happened to Louise. This is when I'm having sex. This is, I like to squeeze my women tight. She ventures deep into the forest with a killer, risking everything to search for the lost woman. One whiff of the police could be it for her. He's a very violent man. And he stared, and he stared, and his eyes were fixed on me. And I'm thinking in seconds, oh my God, he's realized he's made a mistake. He's gonna kill me. On a warm Saturday in April 1995, a woman sets off from her Ottawa home to spend the weekend with her ex-boyfriend and his daughter in the Gatineau Hills in nearby Quebec. She is never seen again. The woman is Louise Ellis, a 46-year-old writer and illustrator with a sense of humor and a flair for whimsy. The artichoke is sure no joke. It's related, you see, to the thistle. Tis truly an art to get to the heart without getting choke in your whistle. She started writing her first book when she was in university. She made pictures using dots from a pencil. She was writing for Chickadee, a children's magazine, and she was also working with children, making murals in schools and that sort of thing, having the children participate in the, the artwork. Louise is a woman with many friends and many passions. In about 1971, I met Louise in a dance class. I thought that she was a very beautiful person. She had kind of a piercing intelligence about her. She was someone who was quite vital, you know, with a lot of health and vitality and energy moving through her system. She's very well educated, she's artistic, she's a feminist, she's into Tai Chi and gardening. Louise's life is very full, but over the years there is one thing she has always longed for. Louise, more than anything, wanted to have a very profound and successful relationship. When she met Brett Morgan, Louise felt she'd finally found an enduring love. For just over a year, they've been living together. To me, in, in many ways, it kind of reminded me of like a, a Charlotte Bronte novel, uh, Wuthering Heights. There's this class difference. She's well-educated, and Brett was extremely blue-collar. On April 23rd, the day after Louise set out for her weekend in the Gatineau, Brett Morgan gets a phone call. He learns that Louise did not show up at her ex-boyfriend's house. Brett files a missing persons report and speaks to the media. This is Louise here. It's frightening and it's confusing. Sergeant Robert Pulford takes on the case of Louise Ellis. Brett told us about what he'd been doing Friday evening. Apparently he and Louise went out and rented a movie called Nostradamus. Partway through the movie, he tells us that John Mazenov, who was Louise's boy from the past, called the house and 
Louise talked to him for about an hour. Louise had maintained a friendship with her ex, John Masonov, and his young daughter, who was celebrating her birthday that weekend. Saturday morning, they woke up and laid in bed and discussed the plans for the day, and she had told Brett at that point that she was going to go up to the Gatineau to visit John Masonov. She packed her bags, and uh, she left between 1 and 1.15. And that's the last he saw of her until he received a phone call Sunday afternoon. Brett calls another friend, Brenda Misson, who lives in the area. She discovers Louise's Jeep at the side of the road, not far from Masonov's cottage. No signs of anything. Um, the doors were locked, and inside were her overnight bag in the back and her um, purse in the front. With the help of Brett and others close to Louise, the police searched the area where the vehicle was found. We were all trying to look for her and involved in the search, you know, scour the bush and this and that. But there is no trace of Louise in the bushes or in the river. Brett Morgan keeps searching on his own initiative. He's making up posters with Louise's picture. He actually went up to the scene where her Suzuki sidekick was on on River Road in Wakefield and actually stood there and talked to each and every person driving a car. And he was out there all the time telling the press that I have to find my sweetie, I have to bring her home. Pulfer fears the worst. Where's Louise? We have to find Louise. Is she alive? Did she disappear? Has she been murdered? It's endless possibilities as to what happened and, and who did it. In April 1995, writer and justice advocate Louise Ellis leaves her Ottawa home for a weekend visit with her ex-boyfriend and his young daughter. Louise Ellis never arrives. Her Jeep is found an hour north of the city in the Gatineau Hills. It is locked with all of Louise's belongings in it. Her common-law husband, Brett Morgan, joins the police in searching the area, but there is no trace of Louise. How are you feeling? Increasingly terror-filled. As police dig deeper into Louise's disappearance, Sergeant Pulfer takes a statement from Brett and learns about the very unusual way he met Louise. We just continued talking to him and got to know a bit more about him, and he was quite free with his information. The couple met at a Supreme Court hearing into the most notorious case of wrongful imprisonment in Canadian history, the case of David Milgard. She was doing research on Milgard because she always wanted to write a book on David. Brett came forward voluntarily to identify an already convicted felon, Larry Fisher, as the man who'd committed the crime for which Milgard had unjustly been convicted. They literally met from across the room. She was very taken by the fact that he was giving testimony about such an important issue. But at the time, Brett was a convict himself. Brett was taking quite a risk, really, being a snitch, a tattletale, uh, not a popular position to be in, in, in prison. And Louise found that quite admirable. Who was being led out of the courtroom in handcuffs, asked if she could talk with him a bit, and she complimented him on the fact that she thought he was courageous to do this. Louise began writing to Brett, and within a short time, they were romantically involved, and she was working to get him early parole. It grew and evolved, and it developed into a plan to get him out of jail so that he could have a productive life with her. Pulfer wants to know more about Morgan's criminal past, and Morgan is surprisingly frank. He says, I killed a hooker in Edmonton in 1978. Morgan had been convicted of manslaughter for killing a woman in an Edmonton hotel. That was 17 years before, and Morgan was high on cocaine. Louise saw him as a man who deserved a second chance. She saw him as someone who lived a hard life. I think he had been abused physically. He was into drugs, and she wanted to be that one woman who would make a difference in his life. Sergeant Pulfer also thinks Brett deserves some benefit of the doubt. Well, we had to be very open-minded because, you know, police are often criticized for having blinders on when it comes to investigations of this sort. And we had to give some credibility to Morgan because he'd reported her missing. 
In their time together, Louise had given Morgan unflagging support. She set him up in business, bought him a truck, bought him tools. His business was uh, gardening, landscaping. Brett has no apparent reason to kill Louise. I have a criminal history, but I would never do anything to harm her. In her home in the Gatineau, Marie Perrant is closely observing the unfolding drama. You know, I'm keeping an open mind here. I want to help this man. I, I'm feeling sorry for him. I'm feeling sorry for the poor woman that's disappeared. Marie, who moved to Canada from her native Scotland two years before, is just completing her training as a private eye. This case is playing out just as she's looking for a practicum. Where her jeep had been found was only 25 minutes from where I lived. That made me a bit uncomfortable. She calls to volunteer her assistance to Louise's distraught partner, Brett Morgan. So it was arranged for the following day for me to go to his house. I had this big adrenaline rush, and I'm thinking, now, what can I do here? You know, I'm, I, I'm not experienced, really. Marie is nervous, but she is also driven by strong personal motivations. I just hated to see women being abused, and I believed being a PI, you know, I could go out and help women. And to help Louise, Marie believes she needs to start with Brett. I went up into the porch, and this man comes forward and he introduces him, Brett, and he took my hand, and he said, thank you for coming, and he, he was quite charming, quite charming. Marie asks if she can tape their conversation, and Brett is entirely comfortable. My hope is the same as I'm sure everybody's, is that yeah, we find, find Louise safe and sound somewhere. Me too. I can't give up. I can't. You know, I mean, she's all I have in my life. It's, it's very hard. I am very alone. He says, our love was profound. He says, we were like soulmates. Marie goes to the site where Louise's abandoned Jeep was found, not far from the cottage belonging to her ex-boyfriend, John Mazenov. Louise's Jeep itself was basically pulled in, situated right where this, this spot is. And the Jeep was actually pulled in right into the edge, very well parked. Inside the vehicle was found a, a black canvas sack that had Louise's pajamas. It had a book of horses, which was inscribed to be given to John Mazenoff's daughter as a gift, and her wallet with all her identification, her access cards, her bank cards, everything. So I took a walk up to the cottage. I wanted to see if there was anybody there. Nobody was there. In late April, many local cottages are still closed up for the winter. Marie wonders what could have happened to Louise in this lonely countryside. Maybe a van sitting there with the bonnet up. The guy pretending he's working on his vehicle. He flags her down. Louise stops and she gets out of the car. And then quickly he grabs her. It only takes seconds. But the car's locked and all Louise's belongings are inside the car. The more I looked at the Jeep, I thought, you know, this seems more like a set, as if someone has deliberately put it there. You know, somebody's locked it and left it. I've kind of decided that it's somebody that's known Louise, but it's not a stranger. I'm pretty convinced of that. In 1995, Louise Ellis leaves her Ottawa home to visit her ex-boyfriend, John Mazenov, in the nearby Gatineau Hills in Quebec. He claims she never showed up. The following day, her Jeep is found at the side of the road in the vicinity of Masonov's cottage. Police searches find no trace of Louise, and her common law husband, Brett Morgan, is bereft. It's frightening and it's confusing. Marie Perrant, a fledgling private eye, recently arrived from Scotland, has volunteered to help Brett investigate Louise's disappearance. I felt genuinely sorry for him. He seemed so distressed. But the grieving spouse has a dark past. Morgan was convicted for manslaughter in the death of an Edmonton woman. His past makes him a suspect in Louise's disappearance. 
But police don't want to jump to conclusions. It seems that Brett has no motive for killing Louise. Pulfer wants to know more about John Mazenov, the ex-boyfriend that Louise was planning to visit. Mazenov and Ellis had had a bit of a, uh, an off-again, on-again relationship. And in fact, Mazenov left Louise when she met Brett Morgan. Now, was Mazenov jealous that Louise Ellis had been so enamored with Brett Morgan? Brett Morgan seems to think that Mazenov is the most likely suspect. He confides his suspicions to private investigator Marie Perrant over a number of meetings. As far as he was concerned, John Mazenov and Louise had this very abusive relationship. I'm starting to think maybe John Mazenov has something to do with this. Maybe he did want Louise to leave Brett Morgan. He would have a motive. The opportunity, well, the opportunity would be there if Louise goes up to the cottage to meet him. Sergeant Pulfer pays a visit to Mazenov at his workplace at the University of Ottawa. He gives the detective an alibi. The whole weekend he had spent with his daughter up at the parents' cottage. The fact remains that Louise's vehicle was found not far from that very cottage. Police stage another search, this time on Mazenov's land. But there is no trace of Louise and no evidence to implicate Masonov. Pulfer considers whether there is anyone else who could have a motive for harming Louise. Brett had ratted out a violent offender when testifying on behalf of David Milgard. Larry Fisher was quite a well-known criminal, a man of violence and uh, no doubt hated Brett Morgan. He's made threats uh, towards me before. At the time of Louise's disappearance, Fisher was out of prison. He had not yet been charged for the murder that Milgard had served time for. Maybe Larry Fisher wanted to get back at Brett Morgan and maybe kidnap and kill Louise Ellis. What better way to get back at someone who basically changed your whole life and put you under the eyes of the law again? Detectives look into the whereabouts of Larry Fisher in fact, on April 22nd, at about 6.10 a.m. in the morning, Larry Fisher was the subject of a road stop in Saskatchewan by an RCMP officer. So, of course, April 22nd is the day that everything happens. So at that time, Larry Fisher was eliminated as a suspect. Meanwhile, in the Gatineau, Marie is looking for new insights into the case by playing back the tape she made of her conversations with the missing woman's partner, Brett Morgan. I would just go over the recordings and analyze everything, just basically take it all back in again. Brett had inspected Louise's Jeep after it was found. And I asked him, when you looked at the, the driver's seat, I said, was it still in the same angle or was it pushed back as if somebody with longer legs might have pushed the seat back to drive? That's when she hears something that blindsides her. He says to me, it's exactly the way I left. And then he stopped. He says, it's exactly the way Louise left it when she left the house. It's exactly the same. Could this be a simple slip of the tongue? Or could it be that the man she's befriended and has volunteered to help is in fact Louise's murderer? In 1995, writer, illustrator, and justice advocate Louise Ellis leaves her Ottawa home and disappears. Her common-law husband, Brett Morgan, had been convicted of manslaughter in the death of a woman 17 years earlier. But he had won Louise's trust through his testimony in a high-profile case of wrongful imprisonment, and it seems that he is shattered by Louise's disappearance. Marie Perrant, who has volunteered to help Brett find Louise, is piqued by an incriminating slip he makes in their taped conversation about Louise's Jeep. Brett turned around and says to me, it's exactly the way I left. And then he stopped. He says, it's exactly the way Louise left it when she left the house. It's exactly the same. Marie wonders if Brett is in fact responsible for Louise's disappearance. Initially, at the very beginning, you know, I saw a man that was distressed. But as time went on, it was as if, you know, Louise was nothing anymore. As for the police, after the investigation of two other suspects goes nowhere, they're refocusing their attention on Brett. 
they've learned that Brett owed Louise over $20,000. She didn't know how she was going to deal with how it was evolving, the, the, the money situation. And it was just at that point, actually, that uh, she disappeared. Pulfer pays a visit to bank manager Lisa Costello, who says that Louise was increasingly agitated by Brett's failure to repay her. She was calling us like four or five times a day, did the money come, did the money come? But Costello says Louise and Brett's financial problems went far beyond the unpaid loan. It was mainly through her credit line that he was writing checks and putting them into his own account. He would forge her signature. She'd be raging mad, blaming the bank that we messed up. And uh, then we would find out that it was Brett Morgan that was actually doing the transactions, although she never would admit to that. Pulfer can now see a motive for Brett Morgan. I think that she was probably going to turn him into the parole office or call the police and say, OK, here's what's been going on. Pulfer then questions Costello about any banking transactions made on the day of Louise's disappearance. He makes a startling discovery. I remember it was one of those aha moments for Bob Pulfer when he clued in. When Brett first reported Louise missing, he said she left Ottawa at 1.15. When Louise's Jeep was found, her bank card was in it. At 2.53 p.m. on April 22nd, that bank card was used to withdraw $280. Bank surveillance tape shows it was Brett who used Louise's bank card at the time Louise was supposedly out of town. We caught him in a lie, and technology caught him in a lie. There is no doubt about it. Brett Morgan is now officially the prime suspect. According to forensic behavior specialist Dr. Matt Logan, Morgan displays a number of psychopathic characteristics. The psychopath is the ultimate button presser. That's where the conning and manipulation and the word charming, which comes up with a lot of people that have been in a relationship with a psychopath, you hear the word charming. He was so charming. I would never do anything to harm her. He's extremely smooth, uh, like you would say, a, a real good con man. If you watch Brett Morgan on television, he seemed very uh, believable. Before Pulfer can convict this killer, he knows he needs more evidence. Pulfer confers with the prosecutor's office. Without uh, Louise Ellis's body, it would have been very difficult to, uh, to pin the murder on Mr. Morgan. We needed to find that body. Police bug Morgan's house, and a surveillance team is set up to watch the premises. Brett, my lock continues not to work, so because of everything that was going on, we became aware of these conversations he was having with someone named Marie. Brett Morgan seems to like her. He seems to be telling her a lot of information. He thought that perhaps if uh, she believed him and helped him out, that yeah, he, uh, she would add credibility to his story. When the police realize that Marie is a newly minted private investigator, they decide she could be a huge asset to the case. We talked to Marie Perrin and told her we want to talk to her about the case she was on. First, they need to know what she thinks about Brett's story. I said, Marie, what do you think happened to Louise Ellis? And in her thick Scottish accent, she says, ah, I think he's killed her. Then the police make an exceptional request. You know what, Marie, uh, Brett really trusts you. He said, you know, we can see that you've got a rapport going with him. And I said, yeah, I says, he's, actually, he's very comfortable with me. And at that point, he says, would you be willing to help us? It was very unique. We've never done it before, where a person was used to get that deeply into a murder investigation to assist the police. They said, maybe try and get information from Brett as to where Louise might be. I said, I'll tell you what. I says, I'll do better than that. I says, I'll get you the body. I felt she was driven to find the body of Louise Ellis so Louise would have some closure and some dignity to be buried properly. It's a tale of fatal attraction. Writer and illustrator Louise Ellis fell in love with convicted killer Brett Morgan after he gave testimony to help free a wrongfully convicted man. After his release, Morgan moved into Louise Ellis's comfortable home. Just shy of a year later, in 1995, Louise goes missing in the Gatineau Hills 
and one month into the investigation, she is presumed dead. Brett Morgan becomes the prime suspect after police find evidence that he had defrauded Ellis. Their suspicions are shared by Marie Perrant, a private eye who had volunteered to help Brett find Louise, but who now believes he is her killer. When the police discover that Marie has gained Brett's trust, they make the extraordinary move of asking this civilian to work with them to help close the net on Morgan. Marie has made a big promise to Sergeant Robert Pulfer. He says, I'll do better than that. I says, I'll get you the body. We thought it was a pretty heavy claim to make for someone on her first assignment as a PI. Getting the body is crucial to the case against Brett Morgan. Worst case scenario is go ahead and, and arrest him without the, uh, the advantage of having the forensic evidence of, of the found body. To find the body, Marie and the investigators form a plan. While police listen in, Marie turns the tables on Brett. She uses his attempt to cast blame on Louise's ex against him. So police want me to go along with this and play this one up. Uh, like I totally believe John Mason has uh, done away with Louise. She was the cat and Morgan was gonna be the mouse. According to Dr. Matt Logan, an expert in psychopathology, this strategy could work. The psychopath uh, can be certainly out-tricked, and these folks will play the game. They love the cat and mouse. They love getting close to people and engaging their sense of fear. I'm saying to Brett Morgan, you know, OK, you've already killed someone. You have the mind of a killer. If you were John Mason, what would you do with the body? He says, can you imagine, he says, a dead body? That's like carrying a sack of potatoes. It's a dead, dead weight. So he's very detailed. He was probably talking about himself when he talked about these different scenarios with respect to the killing of the body and the hiding of the body and that sort of thing. Marie urges Brett to go with her to the woods to search for Louise. I was putting the pressure on him, so he gave me a day. I phoned the police station and said, OK, I've got the data. The police will do everything they can to ensure her safety. Very, very risky and dangerous situation. We had to be careful to make sure we, we protected her. I went down to the station and they took my purse and he inserted a, a recorder underneath the lining of my purse. On a sweltering June day, Marie drives into the Gatineau Hills with a man who is a convicted killer. We had probably two surveillance teams to make sure that we were out there totally covering her. But on the quiet country roads, the surveillance teams can't follow too closely. She was taking a risk, she was very brazen. We told her we couldn't be with her all the time. They drove around for about an hour, an hour and a half. Finally, you can hear the motor vehicle comes to a stop and they get out of the vehicle and went for the walk through the woods. We went further into the meadow and then all of a sudden he stops and he looks at me. Brett was absolutely soaking so much so if he had wrung out his T-shirt, it would have just dripped with sweat. He turned around, he looked at me, and he stared me, and he's eyeing me up and down, and he says, you know what? He says, the only other time he says I sweat like this is when I have sex. It's the early summer of 1995, and Marie Perrant is in the woods searching for the body of Louise Ellis, a woman who's been missing and presumed dead for just over two months. Marie is accompanied by Brett Morgan, Louise's common-law husband, who is now suspected to be her killer. In the public eye, he has played the role of the grieving spouse, and Marie had come forward to volunteer her help to him in finding Louise. But Brett Morgan doesn't know that Marie is now working with the Ottawa police. If he realizes, Marie could be in grave danger. Worst case scenario was her to getting hurt. One whiff of the police could be it for her because he was a very violent man. A surveillance team is tracking every move of Marie Perrant's perilous journey. That is, until they lose sight of Marie and Brett at what could be a crucial moment. He turned around, he looked at me, he stared me and he's eyeing me up and down and he says, you know what? 
says the only other time he says I sweat like this is when I have sex. The surveillance team can hear everything, but they have no idea where in the woods Marie and Brett are. It was very unnerving. If he had decided to, to attack me or whatever, police weren't even anywhere close. I wouldn't have stood a chance against him, to be honest. He was a strong man. Everything's so quiet there. Even the birds, no noise, nothing. No wind. It was eerie, eerie quiet. Suddenly, the quiet is broken by the oppressive whir of a helicopter. And it seems so low down, and it's making this horrendous noise, and I'm going, oh, I don't believe this. And I know who it is. I know it's the police. Her safety was the primary concern we had. The cops are relieved to see Marie is safe, but the operation could be blown. And I can see him starting to freak out a bit. They asked me if I was undercover, and I said to him, you know what, I put my arms out like that. He pat me down. But he doesn't know I've got a wire in my back. And he pats me down, or he starts, and then he stops, and he says, no, I'm not going to do that. He says, I trust you, maybe. But Brett aborts the search. For weeks after, he is skittish and refuses to go back out to look for the body. Marie and Sergeant Pulford devise a new plan to motivate Brett, using Louise's money as bait. Bob Pulfer had called me and asked me to let Brett know the rules around um, him gaining access to her cash. Brett is the heir to Louise's estate, but Costello tells him that until her body is found, Louise can't be declared dead, and Brett can't inherit her money. He's got no money at all. He's got no money to pay the bills. He just doesn't have any access to any kind of money. He was taking office equipment, faxes, photocopiers out of her home that she owned and taking them to a, a pawn shop and pawning them off to get more money. The next component of the plan is to make Brett believe that the police are homing in on Mezenov as the prime suspect. We had Marie Perra tell Morgan that she'd heard through the grapevine that Basically, John Mason had taken a polygraph test with respect to the missing Louise Ellis, and he'd failed the polygraph. Well, I could see him. It's like his mind went, just went into overdrive. Boom, 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 boom. I said, now, all we need is a body. If we find Louise, he says, you know, I could be blamed for this. So at that point, we're sitting down, and he's having a beer with me. He says, you could be undercover. And at that point, he's leaning over towards me, and he's getting closer to my face. And, I, you know, I just thought for a moment, God, what do I do here? Is he testing me to see if I'm really, if I, if I was a cop, I'm not going to kiss him. Within seconds, I make that judgmental call and I decide, yes, I'm going to go with this. So when he does kiss me and I do respond, oh, I just made my, my blood go so cold. But I did it and it seemed to put him very much at ease. But the police who are watching are not comfortable with this at all, and with good reason, according to criminal psychologist Dr. Matt Logan. The thrill of going back to the scene of the crime is, is often sexual. It's a very, very scary game for a person to be playing with someone if that person had a total lack of remorse and lack of empathy. I get a call on my cell phone. It's the police. And I say, Marie, get out of there. No. She pretends to be talking to her daughter. OK, Teresa, yeah, I'll be home shortly. OK, sweetheart, there's salad there for supper. And I says to Brett, you know what, I have to get home for Teresa. I need to get home. What are we going to do about tomorrow? It's this search on. Are we going to do this? And he says, yes, we're on for tomorrow. Marie has accomplished what she set out to do, but she gets an earful from the police. We debriefed her later on that night, and we really dumped on her. You know, what are you doing? Why are you playing that? You cannot get close to that man. It's dangerous enough without him feeling you have some feelings towards him. My main objective was to find Louise. And if it meant that I had to kiss Brett Morgan, I get him to totally believe in me, trust in me, you know, then so be it. This is the chilling story of Louise Ellis, a woman gone missing 
whose body it's suspected is hidden deep in the forest. Marie Perrant is a novice private investigator who has formed a relationship with Louise's common law husband, Brett Morgan, a previously convicted killer. She has offered to help him find Louise. I really wanted to find her. I really did. Marie is now convinced that it was Brett who killed his common law wife, and she has been working with the police to entrap him. Okay. Uh, I imagine that a lot of this. Brett is convinced that finding the body will lead to the arrest of Louise's ex-boyfriend and allow Brett to claim Louise's money. In fact, the police are poised to charge Brett. They're depending on the recovery of the body for the evidence they need. If Marie loses Brett's trust, a killer could get away with murder. Even worse, Marie could be his next victim. On July 7, 1995, Marie Perrant drives to the woods with Brett Morgan for the second time. I'm thinking, is this the day that I'm going to find Louise? All I wanted was Louise. That's all I wanted. Uh, of course, I'm a bit nervous. You're driving along here. There's a body out here. And you've got the man sitting beside you. He's actually killed this woman. It was really quite eerie, I'll tell you. And Brett, can you imagine how he must have been feeling that day? Brett may be wary of a trap, but criminal psychologist Dr. Matt Logan comments on why he might be compelled to return to the woods. There's just a high need for, for adrenaline. Brett Morgan may have actually suspected Marie Perrant of being involved with the police or even being an operative, an undercover officer, but uh, still did what he did. And that indicates to me again um, that, that he could be interested in that stimulation. I might, I'm that close to getting caught, I might get caught. It's just so exciting to be that close to the edge. The police have wired Marie's purse for sound, and she tries to keep them abreast of her whereabouts. I would come to a street called Rue Parra and they would, you know, I'd say to Brett, oh look, Rue Parra. I'm banking on the police picking up exactly where I am. Marie Perrant returns to the place where she entered the woods with Louise Ellis's killer. Brett's looking at me. He says, you're not nervous, me? I said, what are you talking about? You're not nervous to be in the woods with a convicted killer? Should I be? The psychopath has a much greater tendency to, to do a very brazen uh, act of violence. I would say that she would be at huge risk if he knew she was wired. I said, do you trust me, Brett? He said, yes. I said, well, I trust you. So we continued. It seems that Brett is not so much searching as he is leading Marie. Manny says to me, just be careful, there's barbed wire. I'm thinking to myself, how do you know there's barbed wire? It's a lot about power and the power of being able to go back as, as if being God and saying, I can be back here and nobody's gonna get me. So we're coming in and we're going deeper and deeper. The sun's shining through the trees, always remember. Then as they come upon a clearing, something catches Marie's eye. Brett, what's that? She looked at me. It's Louise. And then I noticed the running shoe. It felt like time has stopped. Brett stared. And his eyes were fixed on me. And I'm thinking in seconds, oh my God. He's realized he's made a mistake. He's gonna kill me. I moved forward and I grabbed him. Brett, Brett, it's all right. You're okay, don't worry. We found her, we found her. She's all right, don't worry, it's okay. Me staring, me staring. And at that point he blinks. And it's almost like I broke that chance fix, that, that stare that he had. 
And I thought, I'm okay, I'm safe. If she hadn't said things the way she did or hadn't done things the same way, she could have been uh, his next victim. She was very brave and she was very convincing. She knew what to say to him to, to calm him down. And we walked over towards Louise. What was left of her. And then he gets down on his knees and he wails, he cries. And he's shouting, Louise, Louise, Louise. The surveillance team has heard everything. They're both extremely emotional, crying and screaming and... <laughs> it was somewhat of a, I found, a performance by him. Later that afternoon, Brett reports the discovery of the body. He is confident that the murder will be pinned on Masonov, but instead, Morgan is confronted by police and arrested. Once he walked in the front door of 474 Elgin Street on that day, he never saw freedom again. Detective Wilford said to me, right, Mary, is there, would you like us to pass a message for you to Brett? I said, you say to Brett Morgan from me, how does it feel to be taken down by a woman? I've never heard of a, a PI who's gone to that extent, to that danger to assist the police, to assist the family, and to assist abused women. She was determined. She was determined to see this through. Uh, she's very brave. Brett Morgan is found guilty of first-degree murder, though he maintains he is innocent. We believe she was getting ready to go out, maybe to go visit John Mazenup, and I, the, it's the Crown's theory. He went into the bathtub and strangled her to death in the bathtub and wrapped her body up in the shower curtain. Put it in the back of the Suzuki and took her up and deposited her in a bunch of bush, covered her up. I've seen people have more respect for burying their dogs than he did for her, just covered up with a bunch of bushes. On a chilly November night in the quiet town of St. Catharines, Ontario, 72-year-old Bruce Furman is returning from his usual bike ride at the usual time. As the senior brings his bicycle inside the garage, he meets a violent demise. Tiger emergency, death on your door. When Bruce Furman is found, his body is draped over his bicycle with a stream of blood flowing from his head. Is he unconscious? Yes, he is. A bloody pipe wrench matted with hair rests on the work table beside him. There's blood everywhere. Who would murder this seemingly quiet, retired man, and why? As the police dig deep into the victim's startling past, they find nothing is as it seems. You'd open one door and ten more doors would open. And the truth is more surprising and disturbing than detectives could have imagined. There's not a lot of cases like this and it's kind of unbelievable. A foul conspiracy based on loyalty and greed is uncovered. You don't use your family, especially in such a despicable way. quiet city of St. Catharines, 72-year-old Bruce Furman, a father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, is enjoying his retirement. He rode his bike daily. Yeah, he's quite active. He was a good-looking guy and just as charming as anybody you could possibly meet. Fun to be with. He was very handy. He had a 300-acre hog farm, and like farmers usually they can build and fix anything. He used the garage for his wood shop, and he built a garden shed, and it looked like a, a little girl's playhouse. After farming, Bruce had become a realtor, and he met his common-law wife, Margaret Benesh, when he sold her home. They did camping, uh, they had a motor home, and uh, shopping across, across the border. But after eight years together, Bruce and Margaret are splitting up. My father was living in the basement, and 
Margaret lived upstairs in the house. Bruce is looking forward to settling the separation and moving on to a new chapter. I believe he had another 20 years or more of life left in him. On the evening of November 27, 2001, Bruce and Margaret are each going about their separate lives. Margaret and her daughter Elizabeth, who is visiting from British Columbia, have gone to see Niagara Falls lit up at night and have a bite to eat. After Bruce has his dinner, he takes his usual bike ride. But there is nothing usual about the end of his evening. At 7 p.m., he returns to his darkened house and enters the garage. Across the street, neighbors Mark and Michelle Henderson have just put the kids to bed. We were sitting around watching uh, TV, and the doorbell rang. And when I went to answer the door, um, two ladies were standing on the porch. Margaret and her daughter have come home to make a grisly discovery. They were quite uh, distraught because they had come home and uh, Bruce was uh, in the garage with a lot of blood. Niagara emergency, do you need police, ambulance, or fire? Yes, I need an ambulance for the neighbors across the street. There's blood everywhere. Has anybody taken a look at him? Is he um, breathing or anything? Is he breathing? Oh, no. They don't know. Emergency personnel race to the home of Bruce Furman and Margaret Benesh. Police sweep the premises on alert for possible intruders, but the only person on site is Bruce Furman, and he is most certainly dead. November 27, 2001, St. Catharines, Ontario. Former farmer and real estate agent Bruce Furman has his evening routine disrupted permanently. When returning home from a bicycle ride, Bruce is bludgeoned with a pipe wrench in his own garage. At 8.45, his common-law wife and her daughter arrive home to find Bruce dead in a pool of blood. Detective Sergeant Kerry Harrison is appointed as lead investigator on this gruesome homicide. There's so much information to take in, and there's so many possibilities. All you know is you have a victim of a homicide, and you know, you gotta go from there. Outside the Furman house, a videographer captures the police activity, while inside, Detective Karen Mertz investigates the murder scene. The deceased uh, was laying uh, face forward on top of two bicycles. He had one of his hands still on the handlebars of the bicycle. His head was near a sawhorse leg. And on top of that sawhorse was a bloody pipe wrench. Though no one was found in the house, there was clearly an intruder. From what they were telling us, it could have been a break and enter. It appears to be an attack from behind. Uh, nobody else is home. We needed to do a canvas of the neighborhood immediately to see if any other neighbors had seen or noticed anything that was unusual in the neighborhood. Or if, even if anybody else had been, you know, a victim of maybe an attempted break and enter. The team continues a thorough examination of the crime scene. We marked out where the deceased was located on the floor and took photographs. We bagged his hands. Um, we try to preserve the evidence as best we can. They're combing that garage, and they pay huge attention to the smallest amount of detail. The only mark the perpetrators have left behind is a single footprint on the back porch. It was drizzly that night. Lawns were wet. Uh, back porches were damp. The evidence is being washed away even as it is discovered. There's really no tread pattern that they're able to really give us on that footprint. The evidence forensically is, is not giving us a whole lot. What is most perplexing is that no one can see how the intruder entered the garage. 
Detective Mike Adamchik examines the crime scene. When we went to a look and see where Mr. Furman was, we did check for uh, signs of forced entry, and there, there, there was not. Nobody got inside. The door was locked. The house was all, you know, the way they left it. Uh, the theory of a break and enter and someone being in the home, things are going to be ransacked, things are going to be strewn all over the place, and nothing was, nothing was touched, nothing was out of place. If an intruder had been discovered during a robbery, murdering a senior seems an unlikely end to the scenario. It's a pretty serious stand to take to, to kill somebody. He was an older gentleman. They could have pushed him out of the way and ran by and ran out the door and probably got away with it. If this wasn't a break and enter gone wrong, then what could have motivated this savage attack? Harrison sends Detective Mike Adamchik to talk to the victim's estranged spouse and her daughter. They're still at the home of their neighbors who placed the 911 call. Elizabeth and Margaret were sitting on the couch. Um, I think they've been offered a drink by the Hendersons. They were um, quite shaken, both of them. They were they were hyperventilating. Margaret was um, in shock. She she didn't have a whole lot to say and just seemed very disconnected to what was happening. Elizabeth said she was going to be sick and and uh, had to go to the bathroom. On the front porch, police interview the women. Margaret is is an older lady. She's in her seventies. You know, she appeared to be upset. And um, Elizabeth seemed to maybe be the one who was in control and trying to be strong for her mother. Margaret and her daughter seem horrified by Bruce's violent death. That's just beyond the realm of, you know, anything that you would even think of. But they also talk openly about the domestic strife between Margaret and Bruce. Elizabeth lived in British Columbia, um, but she was here visiting her mom in St. Catharines because her mom was going through some difficult personal um, issues. Elizabeth Gatenby has been trying to help the couple reach a separation agreement. It was several months prior that she came in and was sort of like, I guess, doing negotiations, like even splitting stuff up in the house. He was living downstairs, Margaret was upstairs, she would go up and down the stairs. Okay, we'll work this, work this, trying to finalize the divorce in a fair way. But Margaret and Bruce are fighting over everything from figurines to flashlights. There was a court date, I think, on the Friday. Not far from Niagara Falls, a shocking murder has occurred in the quiet city of St. Catharines. Bruce Furman is ambushed in his home and bludgeoned with a pipe wrench after an evening bike ride. At first glance, it seems this is robbery gone wrong. But now, police question whether the vicious murder could be the result of a marriage gone south. Bruce's separation from Margaret Banesh has been particularly bitter. Sergeant Kerry Harrison considers whether this 69-year-old woman could be responsible for Bruce's death. You have to be open to everything and, you know, take the information we get and, and go down each of those paths. At the time of the murder, Margaret Banesh and her daughter claimed to have been at Niagara Falls to see the lights and have some dinner. Harrison sends detectives to check their alibi. Meanwhile, she takes the women to the station where Karen Mertz will scan them for any possible blood spatter. It's very difficult for someone to commit murder and not have some transfer of blood or bodily fluid onto themselves. We just want to be able to cover our bases and make sure that there's nothing that we need to be concerned with. No problem. They are totally cooperative with us. If she could tell us that she was picking up something, that's going to totally change the direction of our investigation. We found nothing. No bodily fluids, no blood. Margaret and Elizabeth are clean. And when detectives return from Niagara Falls, they verify the women's story. They tell us the location where they went for dinner. The staff remember both of them, where they sat. Yes, they were there for dinner. That alibi checks out. They've even checked the timing of the story in case the women committed the murder and then changed their clothes. An investigator did do 
a drive and we had a good understanding of you know when they left the falls and how long it would take them to get home and that was all within the realm of how it should be before the women leave the station they give a routine statement recorded on videotape when asked about Bruce, Elizabeth Gatenby tells the police that there was a dark side to the quiet, retired man the neighbors saw working in his yard. According to Elizabeth, Bruce was not only trying to get every penny out of the separation, he had already moved on to another woman. He told my mother that he was seeing someone else. She made no bones about the fact that she uh, thought, you know, he wasn't a nice man for, for, the, for what he was doing and what he was putting her mother through. He said he would take her to the cleaners. There was nothing she could do about it. Elizabeth says Bruce had a very checkered romantic past. We found out like he'd had like eight other relationships and every time it was the same kind of thing, you know. The women just like gave him whatever to make him go away. According to Elizabeth, Bruce had a habit of leaving his partners with an empty bank account. It was seven to eight women that he'd been married or common law with, that he had befriended. Uh, initially, he'd be a handyman, then dating, move in, marry, and then a short time later, divorce, taking some assets with them. So this is a pattern. Though these allegations about Bruce's financial dealings are unconfirmed, Bruce had undoubtedly broken more than a few hearts. He's made some enemies in his past with, some, with, with what he's done with these women. There are potentially eight women out there with an ax to grind or a pipe wrench to swing. When you have that many women involved, and I'm sure some of them were quite bitter, so we'd have to look at every single one of those people to see um, if the uh, motive was there or opportunity was there. Detective Adamchik will meet with the victim's family to get more insight into Bruce's history with women. When I spoke with the family, they weren't surprised. They knew what his, their father was doing. Diane Carrolls is Bruce Furman's daughter. Dad wasn't a perfect person. But who is? Though Bruce had many relationships, she doesn't think her father set out to swindle the women. What he seemed to be doing was uh, not thinking about what was going to happen. You know, he'd get married and then divorced and be with somebody else, right? You know, and we just went on and on and on like that. Diane was hopeful about Bruce's new relationship. At his age, he should be okay now. He's found Joan, this lovely lady, and he would be fine, settle down, and that would be it. Adam Chick asked Diane and Dawn if any of the women from Bruce's past could have wanted him dead. Just minutes from Niagara Falls, in a charming house in a quiet neighborhood, retiree Bruce Furman, a grandfather and avid handyman, is found bludgeoned in his garage. The murder weapon is his own pipe wrench. He is discovered by his common-law wife, Margaret, and her daughter, Elizabeth. And it seems the crime is a break and enter gone wrong. But investigation shows this is not the case. We did check for signs of forced entry, and there, there, there was not. In fact, it seems like the murder could have been motivated by Furman's romantic past. There's a lot of women off, you know. He's in the midst of separating from Margaret, and she is his ninth marital partner. According to Margaret and her daughter, Bruce took each of his ex-wives to the cleaners. But the investigation turns up no evidence to implicate any of the women from Bruce's past. It's only when the police talk to Furman's family that they learn something shocking. According to them, Margaret Banesh had uttered death threats against their father. My dad had told me at one time that uh, if he was murdered, I would know who had murdered him. He told me that uh, she had uh, grabbed a knife and uh, had swung it at him. I asked him to get out of the house. He said, I can't leave. If I leave, I'll lose everything. And he really did anyways. If threats were made, 
Were they just angry outbursts, or did they foreshadow something more sinister? Though Margaret has an alibi, police reconsider whether she could have been involved in Bruce's murder. You get a strong lead on, in a certain area, then the other ones are put aside. According to his son, Bruce took Margaret's alleged threats seriously enough to report them to his lawyer. She actually threw an ashtray at Mr. Furman uh, and told him that, you know, he'd be dead before she would be paying him support. Bruce's death would not only free Margaret from paying support, she would become the sole heir to his estate. But Don Furman says his father had recently changed his will to leave everything to his children. That will that they made out disappeared and was never found. My brother in Huntsville called lawyers up there to see if anybody had it and nobody could find it. Bruce had told his children that Margaret was trying to get her hands on the will. He came home and Margaret and two neighbors were looking in the ceiling tile of his bedroom. Tearing the place apart, he said he knew that they were looking for the will. What happened to the will is a mystery. Mr. Furman was complaining that paperwork, important paperwork of his was, had gone missing and was going missing. Though police have good reason to suspect Margaret Banesh, there is nothing that tangibly links her to her ex's murder. We had a great motive, but no evidence. That's a big problem. Sergeant Harrison knows it's a big leap from divorce to murder. She's an elderly lady. You're not thinking that, you know, she could carry out something like this. Margaret's alibi is rock solid, and there was no blood spatter found on her the night of the murder. If Margaret wanted Bruce dead, someone else must have done the deed. Is there somebody else stepping up to the plate for her to look after the situation? Harrison is desperate for some evidence. There's pressure. I'm feeling pressure. I'm calling the plays, and we're not getting any touchdowns. It's a long shot, but Harrison starts investigating whether Furman's killer could have come in from out of town. We sent an investigative team out to start to um, attend every hotel motel they could think of. After hitting almost every motel in St. Catharines, Detective Scott Kenny finally enters the QA on Lake Street. We asked to uh, look at who had been registering in the rooms and obtain the stack of cards. What Kenny sees will change the direction of the investigation. The name on the registration card is Elizabeth Gatenby, the daughter of Margaret Banesh. We know she's staying at her mother's, so a huge flag goes off here. Why is she renting a motel room when she's staying with her mother? Police need to find out who occupied that room and whether there's a connection to the murder of Bruce Furman. We found that there had been a couple uh, young males staying in the room and uh, we had the room secured because uh, very critical to make sure that uh, nothing left uh, the room and uh, no evidence was destroyed. The motel had no names on file for the two young men and there is nothing in the room that identifies them. Elizabeth Gatenby has some hard questions to answer. During her initial interview she said she came here by herself on the bus with no one else. Just 20 minutes away from Niagara Falls, the honeymoon is long over for Bruce Furman and Margaret Banesh. In the midst of their ugly divorce, Bruce has been bludgeoned in his garage. And his children claim that Margaret had threatened to kill Bruce on more than one occasion. Could she have orchestrated the murder? There is no definitive evidence. Looking for new leads, police searched the local motels on the chance that the killer had come in from out of town. They make a surprising discovery. Margaret Banesh's daughter, Elizabeth Gatenby, had paid for a motel room she was not staying in. That leads us to go back to look at the video from the St. Catharines bus station to check and see who did she arrive there with. Myself and Greg went to view the videotapes 
and that confirmed the fact that she had gotten off the bus with a male, stood there with that male. He had like a, uh, like a blanket around him. Sergeant Harrison wants some answers, but she tells Gatenby this interview is just routine, a follow-up to ensure nothing has been missed. She has another detective ask the questions so that she and Adam Chick can listen in and assess. I'm going to ask you, first of all, to, to give me some background. Now, Gatenby is relaxed and talks at length about herself and her family. No, my boys are 25, 18, and 11. The interviewer steers the conversation towards Elizabeth's trip to Ontario without revealing that the police know anything about the boys. He talks to her about traveling, uh, you know, spending a couple days on the bus. Elizabeth met a number of fellow travelers, including a kid who seemed down and out. He's got, well, I wouldn't call it a beard and I wouldn't call it a goatee. I'd kind of call it scruff. Trying. Uh, yeah, trying. So hard. <laughs> That's exactly. I've been there. Scruff. Yeah, yeah it was okay. kind of scruff. If I was his mother, I would say, wipe that off. Would you get a cat or something? Elizabeth says that the kid was planning to meet up with a buddy. He had heard that there was work out this way, so he was going to come and he was going to try and find some work. Oh. That was his mission. The youth had no place to stay, and Gatenby used her credit card to get him a room. And then you can just pay me back, and you know, we'll be square, and, you know, and they'll give you a room. Because if you go in there, they're going to take one look at you and go, <laughs> not happy. And, you know, Elizabeth's story seems to make sense, and it's entirely consistent with her history. She is the coordinator of a home for youth at risk. She was an ex-addict herself, and uh, she, uh, that was her mission, is to take care of homeless kids. I love what I do. I love what I do. Her life's work, so to speak, was to help kids that were, you know, down on their luck. You know, that's kind of what she did. But the police have no way to confirm Gatenby's story. She doesn't know the last names of the kid or his buddy, or where they possibly could be now. Harrison and Adamchick can't quite put their suspicions to rest. Sometimes you get those feelings. I don't know, it's hard to say. If she's lying, she's really good. Though Gatenby is convincing, her story seems too pat and too detailed. It's called laying too much track. Everything was just too perfect. Some people, you know, tell me what they did in 30 seconds. It took her probably a half hour, 45 minutes. Sergeant Harrison keeps the interview going, hoping Elizabeth will talk her way into revealing whether she is as genuine and candid as she seems. When the conversation turns back to Margaret, police discover that just weeks before the murder, Elizabeth's mother had attempted suicide. She took an overdose of pills. She couldn't take it anymore. And she, she assured me she was okay. She wouldn't do that again. But I talked to her a few times, and every time I'd say goodbye to her, she'd be crying. So I finally said to my partner, I gotta go see her. Gatenby was afraid for her mother's health and stability. She confesses that her own stress and frustration were getting the better of her. I just said I wished he would disappear off the face of the earth so that this could all be over. Gatenby says her shock at Bruce's violent death has been accompanied by a big dose of guilt. You never in a million years expect that that's what's going to happen. This isn't the way I wanted it before. The interview leaves many questions unanswered, but police know one thing for sure. Elizabeth had strong and ample reasons to want Bruce Furman dead. She said that uh, I wished him dead all this time, and she felt bad at that he was actually dead. Obviously, that's going to put a flag up for me. Near Niagara Falls, the sleepy town of St. Catharines has been shocked by the murder of Bruce Furman a senior who was struck on the head with a pipe wrench when returning home from an evening bike ride. Police have discovered that Bruce had a string of ex-wives, but some follow-up reveals that none of them wanted him dead. The same can't be said for his most recent ex, Margaret Benesh, who is alleged by Bruce's family to have made death threats. 
So far, police can find no evidence to suggest she was involved with his killing. They have discovered some curious details about her daughter, Elizabeth Gatenby, who is visiting from BC. First, she said nothing to police about meeting a down and out kid and getting him a hotel in St. Catharines. There's something, there's, there's more to it than what she's saying. Second, Gatenby has reason to believe that Bruce was going to drive her mother to suicide. She admits there were moments when she wished him dead. I wished he would disappear off the face of the earth so that this could all be over. <sighs> Sergeant Carrie Harrison assigns Karen Mertz to do a forensic workover on Gatenby's rental car in hopes that it will turn up further evidence. We examine the inside and the outside of the vehicle with fingerprint powder and then we utilize the alternate light source. It's helping us see what we cannot see with the ambient light. She examined the car, and there is a fourth ring fingerprint on the rear door of the car. We got elimination prints from Elizabeth and Margaret, so we knew that fingerprint wasn't theirs. Forensic detective Terry Smith will use an automated computer system to see if the print belongs to a known offender. The Canadian database is upwards of 4.3 million sets of fingerprints, so 43 million individual fingers, if you will. The odds of a match are slim to none. It's a rental car, so the chances of fingerprints being in that car would not be unusual. So I can't say we were overly excited. Finally, Carrie Harrison gets the break in the case that she's been waiting for. The turning point was running this fingerprint. That one fingerprint is what, what started the ball rolling. The print is matched to a known criminal. And he lives in Kimberley, British Columbia, not far from Elizabeth Gatenby's hometown of Trail. The RCMP are waiting for him when he returns from his trip to Ontario. What is shocking is that this criminal is just a kid, a young offender who must remain anonymous. He's a 17-year-old kid, very much into the marijuana dealing of that community. Three days after the murder, detectives from St. Catharines, Ontario, fly to Kimberley, B.C., to confront the young offender with the fingerprint evidence. He tells investigators that um, he was requested to come to St. Catharines to kill a guy. The guy he was asked to kill was Mr. Bruce Furman. When investigators ask who hired him, they get an answer that is more surprising and bizarre than they could have expected. Byron, son of Elizabeth Gatenby, who lives and works in Whistler. The young offender says that he was hired by the 18-year-old son of Elizabeth Gatenby and grandson of Margaret Benesh. This is the turning point. Byron Gatenby is arrested in Whistler, B.C., where he ekes out a living as a prep cook. Detective Adamchik flies out to interrogate him, but he does some background checking before the interview. I went to where he lived. He was crashing on someone's couch. Uh, interviewed people he was, were, were hanging out with. Couldn't believe that he was arrested for first-degree murder. Most people consider him quite a gentle person. I did a history of any involvement with the police that Byron had. And we found some indications that he had a very, very tough childhood. Elizabeth Gatenby has mentioned that she had a serious drug addiction when Byron was young. What kind of an upbringing did he have? What kind of a life? Like, was Elizabeth really a mother to him? Byron has had problems with drugs and alcohol himself. In Whistler, B.C., the police grill Byron. It was a, a long interview. Uh, we're talking, I think it was five to six hours. And uh, he wouldn't come clean with it whatsoever. Byron makes a one-way trip back to St. Catharines, 
where Harrison and the team ratchet up the pressure. I think at some point he realizes the jig's up and he finally comes through with the truth. On December 9, 2001, Byron makes a confession on tape. He tells police how he and the kid from Kimberly lay in wait for Bruce Furman. At precisely 7 o'clock, Bruce Furman comes through the door, just in time for his usual evening television show. The young offender was standing behind the door. The door closes right there. Pops him. Wait, pops him with what? Uh, a wrench of some sort. He stumbles down, falls over his bike, caught him again. And that would be Byron's cue to come out of the tool room where he would potentially strangle him. I gave him a boot, gave him a kick, and uh, I looked at him, I actually looked at him, and I just jammed up, couldn't do anything, couldn't move. I was saying, finish it, do it, something to that effect. And uh, I couldn't do it. The young offender finishes the job. Gave him a couple more shots. And uh, we, went to, we went to run. Only six days after 72-year-old Bruce Furman was bludgeoned in his garage, Sergeant Carrie Harrison and her team are homing in on the conspirators to this murder. The victim was found by his estranged spouse, Margaret Banesh, and her daughter, Elizabeth Gatenby, and both women are under investigation. Banesh is alleged to have uttered death threats against Bruce Furman, and Gatenby paid for a motel for two young men. One is a 17-year-old pot dealer who says he was hired to kill Bruce. The other is Elizabeth's 18-year-old son, Byron Gatenby. After hours of interrogation, Byron has confessed to hiring the 17-year-old. The two boys lay in wait for Bruce in the garage. Byron was planning to strangle Bruce himself, but he froze, and the kid from Kimberly savagely attacked the old man with a pipe wrench. Now, police want to know how far this conspiracy to commit homicide extends. Did Byron act alone, or did the matriarchs in Byron's family mastermind the murder? There's not a lot of cases like this. It's kind of, it's crazy. To get the answers, Detective Adamchik puts the pressure on Byron. I told him, I said, you know your mother's using you. You know that. And you're going to rot in jail, and she's going to get away with this. And Harry put his head down. He said, I'm going to go to hell for this. And he looked at me, and he just gave it all up. The truth is an unsettling tale of blood loyalties. For Byron, the murder was all about protecting his grandmother. She was living with Bruce Furman as a common law. He was threatening her physically, emotionally, uh, putting in a, a common law divorce. Um, yeah, uh, trying to try to commit suicide multiple times. That's the only thing that was really close to him still was his, was his grandmother, Margaret. He really, he really cared about. I think. You know, he truly wanted to help his grandmother. And maybe this was the only way, or it was put to him that this was the only way he could help her. And Elizabeth indicated that, you know, he was abusing her and he was to take all of her money and, and sort of built up this, this whole thing. He was manipulated by a master of manipulation. That's what he was done. And his own mother. Elizabeth Gatenby asked her son to murder Bruce Furman. And it was uh, decided that I'm gonna let him take uh, take everything. Who de who decided that to stop this? My mother and I. So I uh, made the trip to come out here to uh, to kill him. It's almost inconceivable to think that a mother would bring her own son into this situation. I've seen some pretty weird things. But for I've never seen that when you you know get your own child to, to kill somebody. 
Elizabeth encouraged Byron to hire someone to help do the job. He uh, found the young offender, who he knew like from the streets. He was a, a drug user. With Byron and the other teen conscripted as assassins, Elizabeth takes care of the logistics. She arranged like all the bus tickets to be picked up. She had code words for what, when they were supposed to do things. Bought them one-piece uh, industrial suits, gloves. The boy on the bus with Elizabeth is actually her son. The young offender arrives a day later. Elizabeth gets the boys a motel in St. Catharines, but they move to Niagara Falls on the day of the murder. Elizabeth takes her mother and they go um, to Niagara Falls. They park the car in the lot of this hotel. She leaves the keys in the back door handle of the car. That's the understanding. So then the boys can now come and take the rental car. Byron and the young offender will use the rental car to drive to St. Catharines to kill Bruce Furman. Elizabeth gave them his schedule. He was by the minute. They knew when, where he was going to be. They pretty much know exactly what time they have to be in that garage. They went, got the key, let themselves in, and waited for him. Afterwards, the boys drive back to Niagara Falls and park outside the restaurant where Elizabeth and Margaret are finishing dinner. So Elizabeth knows that they've returned. She, she, she came out and I, uh, I told her it was done. But, uh, yeah, Grandma didn't have to worry about them anymore. And Elizabeth gives some money for them to uh, go out and party. And when Elizabeth and Margaret get home, they make the discovery they make. And, you know, immediately go across the street where Elizabeth puts on a, an Academy Award performance. And we start rolling. No one but Elizabeth knows if she acted out of love for her mother or with an eye towards her own inheritance. And if Bruce was out of the picture, then her mom would have everything. And eventually, maybe that would carry on down to her. When Adam Chick arrests Elizabeth Gatenby, she is as cool as ever. Told her she was under arrest for murder. Didn't flinch. I think she was so confident that uh, she was untouchable. As for Margaret Banesh, her grandson denies that she had any involvement with the murder. Grandma never knew what was going on. She never had a clue. Even. If she was involved, I don't think Byron would turn his grandmother in. But the police still don't know where the money for the hit was supposed to come from. Elizabeth didn't have any money. Byron didn't have any money. But the money had to come from somewhere. That's one of the mysteries. You know? Where did the money come from? But nothing could be brought towards Margaret. We definitely tried to look at banking information and banking accounts. Um, but there, you know, we weren't able to find anything. There is never any evidence that Margaret Banesh conspired in Furman's death. Many of the investigators feel that she may have. Um, but the way we look at it is, you know, call your first witness. We can't, there was nothing, nothing, and we looked at everything. There was nothing that we could um, find to prove that she had knowledge. Elizabeth Gatenby pleads innocent to the charge of first-degree murder. This mother and youth advocate claims she simply wanted the boys to scare Bruce Furman, not kill him. But Gatenby is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Elizabeth's son, Byron, pleads guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and serves six years. The 17-year-old who bludgeoned Bruce Furman takes a plea for first-degree murder. He is given just six years in prison, the maximum youth sentence. We're getting the people responsible for this homicide. You know, that's a, a relief, but it's such a tragic... A gruesome case that will terrorize a safe and sleepy city. A beautiful young woman murdered in broad daylight, mere steps from a well-traveled bicycle path. Yeah, that was his hunting ground.
A predator who prowls the streets and pathways of Canada's capital in search of innocent prey. You know, this isn't the first time this, this guy's done this. Her brutal death will strike fear into the heart of a community. Well, I still don't go anywhere alone. And set in rapid motion the largest search in the history of Ottawa. It looked from very early on that it was a stranger abduction. They're not easy to solve. Will police be able to catch the killer before he strikes again? afternoon on August 6, 2003, when Ardeth Wood borrows her brother's bicycle and sets off, as she often does, from her parents' home in Orleans, on the outskirts of Ottawa. The 27-year-old university student is taking a break from classes at Ontario's University of Waterloo, much to the chagrin of her good friends back on campus. The last time I saw Arda, she was standing at the door at my apartment and I, I asked her when she would be back and she told me the date and I can't remember what it was now, but it seemed like a long time and I remember she said, I know, but you can give me a call and that sort of thing and, uh, and then she left. Jill and Ardeth met when they were both working as teaching assistants in the university's philosophy department, and Ardeth made quite an impression. She was very tall and had long blonde hair, and she always had interesting clothes on, and uh, she was beautiful. <laughs> um, I was immediately intimidated by her, and I, I didn't know what to expect, and she turned out to be so much more warm and kind and considerate than, than I ever would have thought. The two became fast friends, meeting regularly for coffee and chatting for hours at a time. Sometimes we would be talking about teaching. Sometimes we would be talking about the future. I don't think she wanted to, you know, sacrifice having a family. I think that was the main goal to her. The trip home to Orleans gives her the chance to spend some time with her close-knit family. And on this afternoon, Ardeth has promised to get back from her bicycle ride in time to go shopping with her mom. It is a typical August day in the Ottawa region, hot and humid. And there is a thunderstorm brewing on the horizon. When the afternoon comes and goes, and the always responsible Ardeth has still not returned home, her family begins to worry. They head out looking, but find no sign of her. When night falls, they abandon their search and call police. Early the next morning, the Wood family contacts friends and neighbors, and they meet at Ottawa's Aviation Museum. But the searchers have their job cut out for them, with nearly 200 kilometers of city bike paths and no idea where Ardith was headed. The local media gets wind of her disappearance. Ardith Wood's parents reported the young woman missing yesterday and ask anyone with information to call. Word travels quickly. Her boyfriend, Kristen, he phoned me at my apartment and he said, he said, Ardith is missing. And the whole time we were thinking, we'll get a call at any point and it will be somebody saying, oh, it was a misunderstanding or, uh, you know, she phoned. But even the police fear for Ardith's safety. Right now they're just searching for a missing girl. At that point, I'm thinking, it's not good. Co-lead on the case, Jenny Edge, is already anticipating a difficult investigation. 
when you're talking about uh, a young woman who's had no police involvement and has led a, a very normal, very average, very well-behaved lifestyle, it, it complicates things greatly right from the very beginning. Because police have nothing concrete to work with, no troubled history, no obvious motive, and not a single suspect. They appeal to the public for any information that could help them get a start. And within minutes, the phones begin to ring. One of the calls is from a young woman who tells police about an unsettling encounter. The same afternoon, Arda disappeared. She was heading east into Orleans, and the male had stops her to ask her some questions. She described him as fairly young, no shirt, light hair, in his 20s, muscular build. She described him as being quite good looking, but that once he started to talk, he, he just wasn't quite right. He was a little creepy. The man tried unsuccessfully to lure her down an isolated pathway. She fled, but he pursued her until she reached the safety of a residential neighborhood. So we're thinking, this guy is down here. He's a sexual predator, and he's in the area. Philosophy student Ardeth Wood has come home to Orleans, Ontario, just outside of Ottawa, to spend summer vacation with her family. On a hot August day, the 27-year-old borrows her brother's bicycle and heads out for a ride, promising to be back shortly to take her mother shopping. Despite a heavy afternoon thunderstorm, Ardeth fails to return home. The family heads out looking but finds no sign of her, and they call police. The following morning, friends and neighbors join in the search for the beautiful young woman. But with hundreds of kilometers of bicycle paths and no clear idea where Ardeth was headed, police and volunteers come up empty-handed. When local media reports Ardeth's disappearance, a young woman contacts police. She tells them about her encounter with a man who aggressively tried to lure her off the bicycle path and into the bushes. The witness provides a detailed description of the young man and works with a forensic artist to come up with a composite of the suspect. Co-lead on the case, Jenny Edge. It's a joint process because she can say, no, the, the eyes weren't quite like that. Possibly they were turned up a little bit more or, or more deep set. And they work on it over a number of hours until it's as close to what she recalls as possible. Police show the composite to artist's family and friends, but no one recognizes the man. It looked from very early on that it was a stranger abduction. They're not easy to solve because there's nothing to link the victim to the offender. So you don't have a, a starting spot. Since police aren't sure that this man had anything to do with Ardeth's disappearance, they hold off on releasing his image to the public for fear of sidetracking their investigation. Then the phone call that will become the major turning point in the Ardeth Wood case. It is from a 16-year-old girl who is sure she saw Ardeth on the bicycle path the very morning she went missing. And what she witnessed that day makes investigators' blood run cold. She first heard a scream. And she looked up and she looked through the bush. And she said she saw Ardeth talking with a male who seemed very agitated and very animated. She became concerned, the witness did, and she sees Ardeth and the suspect going down a path towards the uh, Greens Creek with their bikes. Thinking the two could be boyfriend and girlfriend, the young woman hesitates to intervene, but she does follow them briefly down the pathway. A little further down, she indicated that both bikes that she'd seen them on were lying on the ground on the left side of the path. The witness stops and listens, but hears nothing. And she indicated to us at the time that she was so concerned there was something wrong that she had her cell phone out. She dialed 911. She holds her finger over the send button, but never presses it. 
When the thunderstorm worsens, the young woman heads home. And as she was leaving, she heard another scream. But she kept going. When the young girl sees artist's picture on the news, she calls police, who show her the composite. She confirms that it's the man she saw with Ardeth Wood, the same man who tried to lure the other witness into the bush. Both encounters were in the Greens Creek area. Investigators immediately narrow their search. Sergeant Brad Hampson is the search manager. Uh, you would have seen uh, helicopters, uh, search and rescue technicians from Trenton, and then hundreds of trained search and rescue personnel from the Ontario Provincial Police. And then on top of that, you had the actual police officers, untrained search personnel. And the scores of volunteers who just keep coming. It ended up, I think, being somewhere almost close to 1,000 people that showed up uh, within the first few days. Ardeth Wood has disappeared while out for a bicycle ride just east of Ottawa. When the media reports her missing, witnesses come forward. One young woman was approached the same afternoon Ardeth went missing by a man who tried to lure her into the bush. Another witness saw Ardeth arguing with a man near Greens Creek, then watched while the two of them walked down an isolated pathway. Although she heard a scream, she didn't call 911. When it began to storm, she headed home. And as she was leaving, she heard another scream. But she kept going. Four days later, the city is the site of the largest search in its history. In addition to hundreds of police, Canadian forces, and search and rescue personnel. They had close to a thousand volunteers searching both the wooded area, the parkways, and going door to door within short order. I think it probably hit, uh, struck a chord with most people in the community, and especially because these are trails that are used by everybody throughout the city of Ottawa. But it's a phone call from a community on the other side of the Ottawa River that's caught the attention of investigators. That call came in from a phone booth over in Gatineau, and the gentleman stated uh, it was an accident. I didn't mean to kill her. I took her across the river and buried her in Gatineau. They send officers to the phone booth, but find no fingerprints and no way of knowing whether the call was made by a killer or a crank. Back at headquarters, police receive a tip from another female cyclist who recalls details from her conversation with the same strange man on the bike path. He gives her some very important information that he was from Plantagenet. And it's just an odd, odd name. Not too many people know the town plantation. It's very, it's small. It's about 60 kilometers east of Ottawa. It could well be an important clue to the man's identity. The woman who reported the encounter feels lucky to have gotten away. She just started biking faster and faster and went home. And the first thing she said to her little sister was, don't go on near the bike path. Stay off the bike path today. There's a weirdo out there. Back at the Greens Creek search site, Police are honing in on the creek itself. What they find is heart sinking. The divers uh, were actually working in extremely murky water. I think they almost had zero visibility in there. And so they were just by hand and feel under the water trying to locate uh, any kind of evidence they could. And then we got the information that they had located a bicycle and that it, it fit the description of the bicycle that uh, Ardeth Wood had been riding when she went missing. It, it, it's telling us it's not gonna be good news. The following morning, five days since Ardeth Wood's disappearance. We called the OPP and requested their cadaver dog. And within short order, they found Ardeth. 
on the east side of the uh, Greens Creek. She was on the ground about 25 meters from shore, hidden in a little recessed area behind uh, two large trees. Police inform Artis' family that they've finally found her. They know one way or another now. So there's that relief, but then there's all kinds of new feelings that come in, of course, once they know they've lost their daughter. Or their best friend. At first, we thought that she'd been found in the water. So I pictured her in the water it seemed peaceful to me and so I was almost comforted by the thought that that's where she had been the whole time and then we heard that she had been partially buried then we knew that that somebody else had been involved Ardeth Wood who has been missing for nearly a week has been found her body discovered by a cadaver dog meters from the bank of Greens Creek on the outskirts of Ottawa. The 27-year-old philosophy student had been reported missing five days earlier when she failed to return home from an afternoon ride. Artist's borrowed bicycle was located submerged in the creek. When we found out about the bike, we figured out that this was probably a, a homicide investigation at that point. The search for Ardith is the largest in the capital region's history, and the extensive media coverage prompts a flood of calls from witnesses, most of them women. Many had been approached by what appears to be the same strange and aggressive man in the Greens Creek vicinity. Yeah, that was his hunting ground. One young woman saw the man and Ardith arguing and then walking their bicycles down a secluded pathway. The 16-year-old almost calls 911, but thinking it a lover's quarrel, decided to leave them alone. Police cordon off the crime scene and begin the meticulous search for anything that might lead them to Ardith's killer. Based on algae found in her lungs, investigators know that she drowned in Greens Creek. And though her body was found naked, there is no forensic evidence of sexual assault. Jenny Edge is co-lead on the investigation. The results all came back negatives. There was no fingerprints, no DNA, no trace evidence of any sort. It was very discouraging to hear that. Investigators decide to make public the composite of their suspect, despite the potential drawbacks. It can generate information that really leads you astray. We had people saying that they had seen the man in the composite working at a grocery store. Or, I saw that guy in the composite on the bus last week. Others were very, very detailed, people calling in to say, that's my ex-husband, he has issues with women, I know it's him. There was about a thousand tips within two days after the, uh, the composite went out. One of the investigators assigned to follow up on them is Ian Pidcock. We were the ones that were responsible to, to solve this thing. I mean, Ardeth was dead. Somebody had to do right by her. On a beautiful August morning, Ardeth Wood's body is laid to rest in Ottawa's Notre Dame Cemetery. 600 people attend the service. A thousand pay tribute on the street outside. So it was a huge story in Ottawa. People were in shock and the city was worried. For weeks, police worked their way through an avalanche of tips. But even the most promising produce no strong suspects. On September 10th, over a month since Ardeth Wood's body was found, investigators decide it's time to make public an important detail about the man who may have killed her. According to witnesses who met him on the bicycle path, the suspect has a tattoo. Police release a likeness of the winged eagle seen on his upper arm. The hopes were that it would provide additional tips, and it did. It provided a huge number of tips. Anybody that had a bird tattoo, the people were calling in, no matter where it was on their body, on their face, on their chest, anywhere. So we, you know, we'd run around and chase the tattoo for a while, which 
kind of bogged down the investigation, but it had to be done. For months, police do their legwork, sifting through the now nearly 4,000 tips, determined to weed out the man responsible for killing Ardeth Wood. I had a spreadsheet with all the persons of interest on it and found myself waking up at night sometimes and I could see them all sort of sc just scrolling sort of over and, and over again. And every day I drove to work, I drive by Greens Creek and so every day I'm thinking of Ardeth. I'm driving by, I'm going, come on, let's get, let's get this solved. Then in April 2004, eight months after Ardeth Wood's death, Police believe they may finally have found the man who murdered her. A male from Gatineau who was called in by two different callers very early on in the investigation. Not only is Gatineau the same community from which police received the anonymous murder confession, this man was also seen in the vicinity. He was spotted directly across from the crime scene, uh, riding a bicycle. Somebody who passed by said, hey, that guy looks a lot like the comps they're drawing. Police interviewed him at the time. So something about what he had said or how he had acted um, just didn't sit right with them. And they recommended investigators speak with him again. It was a follow-up interview, but a little bit more probing. And there was something just off on his answers. He was very nervous. He had some behavioral issues. We knew that he biked a lot. Everything we were looking for, he had on. Like we were looking at the age 22, blonde hair, uh, well built. He had a tattoo similar to the one that we were looking for. And he had been a student at Plantagenet High School. This really sort of elevated him into uh, to a higher priority file. Police convince him the only way to clear his name is to speak to them yet again. The interview went on for three hours. I, I felt that he had some issues with the impulse control. He had a lot of anger. He talked about how he was, uh, he was like a scorpion under a rock. You never knew what they were going to do. And this scorpion had no alibi for the day of the murder. Police put a surveillance team on his tail to see what he does. And we get pretty high on him. We follow him around for about a week and a half. We like everything we see. And then we bring him in for a polygraph. Will their suspect pass or fail? We're so anxious. We're so excited that we have this, this terrible homicide solved. It's been eight months since the grisly discovery of Ardeth Wood's body on the banks of Greens Creek, just outside of Ottawa. Police determined that the 27-year-old university student had been drowned. A thorough search of the crime scene produces no DNA evidence. One young witness recalls seeing Ardeth walking her bicycle down a secluded path with an unidentified man, whom others describe as odd and aggressive. Investigators release a likeness of the suspect and a composite of his tattoo, resulting in a flurry of tips from the public. We had like a thousand calls, we were up to a thousand calls within two days including some about a man who lives in the same community from which police received an anonymous confession to Ardeth Wood's murder. The Gatineau resident bikes a lot, matches the description of the suspect, and has a tattoo. I'm thinking it's going to be hard to clear this guy. He agrees to a polygraph, and though the results can't be used in court, they can indicate to investigators they've got the right suspect in their sights. We were quite anxious to see what happened with this thing. We were all cramped into the tiny little monitoring room for the polygraph, uh, waiting. It had taken investigators weeks to assemble their case against the Gatineau man. They watch it fall apart in mere minutes. He passed with flying colors. And we went from the top of the roller coaster to the bottom in like a second. It's hard not to uh, all of a sudden just lose all hope. On August 6, 2004, the community marks the one-year anniversary of Ardeth Wood's murder. 
and investigators seem no closer to catching the man who committed it. From the tips that continue to pour in, police have identified hundreds of possible suspects. Some are cleared immediately, others are moved to the back burner. Like a 23-year-old Ottawa resident by the name of Christopher Myers. Case co-lead, Jenny Edge. Christopher Meyer met a lot of our criteria, but at the very initial time that he was interviewed as a person of interest, he provided an alibi, provided the name of the person he'd been at home with and that he'd gone to work after that. What's more, Myers had no tattoo. Police turned their attention to other persons of interest. Then, on a summer evening in 2004, a man approaches a young woman on an Ottawa street. He engages her in conversation. She asks him for a cigarette, and he offers to get her one from home. When she steps into the entranceway of his apartment building, he drags her into the basement and attacks her in the laundry room. Police on this case suspect Christopher Myers, but at the time have no evidence to charge him. That's when Ardeth Wood investigators hear about the assault and decide to interview him a second time. But Myers disappears, and it's not until February 2005 that they track him down. Detectives Ian Pidcock and Dave Smith arrive at Myers' apartment unannounced. He came out and met us on his doorstep. And uh, I was really struck, yeah, this guy does look like the cops. When he started to speak, I noticed that he had these crowded teeth. And I thought back to uh, what one of the witnesses had said. Um, it was like he had too many teeth in his mouth, the suspect. I thought, oh, geez, that's interesting. Can't ignore that. But what about a bird tattoo on his upper arm? Investigators ask him. Chris, can we just see if you have any tattoos anywhere? He took his whole shirt off, and there was, it was nothing there. But police are convinced Myers is hiding something. And while they can't make him take a polygraph, they can ask him to. Myers reluctantly agrees to the test. And I notice his body language changed. And, and it was, he started to bounce a little bit off the wall. And it was indications of nervousness. Myers never shows for his polygraph. And investigators decide to take another look at his alibi the day of the murder. He worked at a particular restaurant down in the market, and he had a uh, time card that showed on that particular day he punched in at around 3.30. Myers was seen by his landlady at home late that morning. Was it possible he could have biked out to Greens Creek for one o'clock when witnesses saw Ardeth with the man on the pathway, then had time to get back home before heading to the restaurant for his shift? Detective Smith bikes the route with time to spare. It just proved that it is physically possible, even without a car, to get that far away, do what he did, get back home and, and go to work as though nothing happened. But without hard evidence, police have their hands tied. Then on the night of April 23, 2005, a young woman, similar in appearance to Ardeth Wood, is making her way home along the interprovincial bridge between Ottawa and Hull, Quebec. She was approached by a male on a bicycle who tried to engage her in conversation. She tells him to leave her alone, and he starts to ride away. Then suddenly turned, came back, and grabbed her and dragged her into a bush. She manages to fight him off. He steals her purse and takes off. The incident is reported as a robbery, and the Ardeth Wood investigation team doesn't learn about it for nearly a month. That's when the attacker strikes again. May 11, 2005, North Bay, Ontario. In the early hours of the morning. A young woman, again, similar in appearance to Ardeth, was walking home, approached by a male on foot. 
again, asking her where she was going. Could he walk with her? He tells her he's looking for a particular street, and she sends him off in that direction. He reappeared uh, suddenly a, a couple of minutes later, grabbed her, and dragged her into some bushes. He twists her neck with such force, she says she thought it would snap. The woman fights back, kicking and screaming. A homeowner came out and interrupted the assault, and the suspect ran away, leaving his cell phone behind. It is more than a year since Ardeth Wood's death, and police seem no closer to catching her killer. The man investigators were convinced had committed the murder easily passed his polygraph. It just takes the wind out of your sails completely. Then police learned that a man they had already spoken with early on in the Ardeth Wood case might now be connected to a recent sexual assault. His name is Chris Myers, and investigators decide to interview him again. Not only is the 24-year-old a dead ringer for the composite, he appears nervous at the idea of a polygraph, then never shows up for the test. Police review Myers' alibi and determine that he did have time to travel by bicycle to Greens Creek, commit the murder, and return in time to punch in at his restaurant job shortly after 3.30. But we don't have evidence. We don't have smoking gun. Then in April of 2005, a young woman is sexually assaulted while crossing an Ottawa bridge, and another attacked in May while making her way home in North Bay. The assailant drops his cell phone at the North Bay scene and police trace it to an Ottawa woman who says it belongs to her son. His name is Christopher Myers. While North Bay officers prepare to arrest their sexual assault suspect, we had two of our robbery investigators up in North Bay. They caught wind of the sexual assault. He said, that guy has a lot of similarities to uh, the Ernest Wood killer. Might investigators have finally found their man? And can they assemble the evidence they'll need to bring him to justice? Kinnear heads to North Bay to interview Myers, who's just been picked up by local police on his return from a week-long bike trip. You know, he's a little dirty, he's uh, disheveled, but his demeanor is very calm. Hey, Chris. I go in and I tell him I'm with the Ottawa police and I'm, I want to talk to you about the Ardeth Wood killing. And he said, oh yeah, I've already been spoken to about that several times because he had been. I've never murdered anybody in my life. I'm like, whatever, cool, cool. So I explained to him, like, go on the polygraph. Take the polygraph and if it clears you, we're off your tail. We're, we just want you off our plate. And he agreed. Yeah, no, I'll take the polygraph. Yeah, I appreciate it. While police arranged to return Myers to Ottawa for the test. Jerry and I went out and spoke with Chris's ex-girlfriend. She tells them that he was physically abusive towards her and sexually aggressive with her friends. That he regularly biked the pathways in and around Ottawa and often rode the streets of the city late into the night and they confirm that Chris Myers went to school in Plantagenet, just like the cyclist who had aggressively approached young women on the pathway the day of Ardeth Wood's murder. Although Myers has repeatedly proved to police he has no tattoos, his former girlfriend provides the missing piece to the investigator's puzzle. She said he would use the, you know, little fake stick-on tattoos that we used to use as kids. And he, he just loved these things. And she did tell us that he had one similar to what we were looking for at the time. Police are now certain that Myers is their murderer. Will a polygraph confirm it? Over the course of five hours, the examiner repeatedly asks Myers. In August of 2003. His answer is always the same. But the polygraph results tell her otherwise. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind, Chris, that you're responsible for our death's death. 
I knew in my mind it was him. Now, knowing if I can prove it is a different, a different matter. No matter what anybody says, whatever a machine says, nothing. I did not kill nobody, period. Given the resemblance of Ardeth Wood to the victim of the Ottawa Bridge assault. A little smaller in stature, but very similar in physical uh, appearance. And the similarities between the two attacks. He approached her and then tried to strike up conversation and says, do you want to, you know, do you want to hang out? Investigators bring the sexual assault victim in to try and identify her assailant. She was shown a lineup, including uh, Chris Myers. And verbally, she didn't say that's him, but physically, she was almost violently ill. But even if Chris Myers is guilty of multiple sexual assaults, there is no evidence to charge him with murder. Forensic results showed no sign of sexual assault against Ardeth Wood and no DNA left at the crime scene. And there's not a piece of clothing, there's not a piece of identification. We had zero evidence from the scene to link Ardeth to Christopher Myers. The whole case rested on a statement coming from him. On October 13, 2005, more than two years after the murder of Ardeth Wood, police prepare for what could be their final interview with the man who they believe killed her. When Ottawa resident Christopher Myers drops his cell phone at the scene of a North Bay sexual assault, local police track him down and arrest him. That's when an officer notes the 25-year-old's resemblance to the composite in the Wood homicide and contacts Ottawa investigators. Jerry Kinnear travels to North Bay to interview Myers and convince him to take a polygraph. He fails. Meanwhile, Jenny and I speak with his most recent girlfriend who supplies a ton of information on him and makes him look very interesting. And when one of the sexual assault victims clearly identifies Christopher Myers from a photo lineup, investigators are certain Myers attacked and killed Ardeth Wood. But proving it is another matter. Police need a confession from Myers, and the man whose job it is to get it is top-notch interviewer Martin Graham. To immediately bring the subject back to that time, so what we had done is we created maps, we'd put up his uh, mugshot from the time against a composite below, and number of sightings of him. But will the strategy work? Chris Myers? Yes. Nice to meet you. Detective Sergeant Martin Graham. Graham decides to play hardball. Yep. <laughs> We know what time Ardith Wood went missing. We know you were there. We know you spoke to her. But Myers isn't buying in. So when did you meet her? I never have. Chris, it's not an issue. How do I know what the woman looks like? <laughs> I'm not interested. Graham realizes he's made a crucial mistake one that could cost him the confession. He hadn't bought into it in any shape or form because he literally told me, you have nothing on me. You have nothing. Like, Jesus, come on, tell me. There's no DNA because I'm not there. That's... There was DNA, you guys have already arrested me for it. Why? Graham changes tactics, gradually becoming Meyer's confidant. He said, well, listen, you know one of the things that I'm happy to do? Can I get you a glass of water or something? We can talk through this. Let's get it from the back of your head. I know it's not going to be easy to talk about. I know that. The way he would, would speak with him, you know, it, it, it's almost like a father-son. You know, it's all right. You can tell me. You can tell me. And, and he just started giving it up. She puts down her speed bike. You put down your mountain bike. Hug and kiss. And then what? Show me what you did. All right, come here, stand up. I want, you know what? One of the best things you can do, and the easiest ways to recall memory, is to relive it. So you tell me what you did, everything you did. Put your hands on. Yeah. And what did she do? And then she gets back. Yep. 
and then the girl walked up, and then I took off. And then you took off? Yeah. Although Myers doesn't directly admit to murdering Ardeth Wood, he does confess to meeting her on the bicycle path. If you'll excuse me for a minute, Chris, is there anything I can get you? Graham gambles that Chris Myers is prepared to admit to more. I'll tell you what you can do for me. What I want you to do is draw in your best hand, right, Roy, whatever you can remember, where you stood, where the bikes were and everything else, okay? We'll, we'll be all right. We'll carry on in a few minutes, okay, Chris? To investigators' relief, Myers takes the bait, providing police with the kind of detail only someone who'd been down at the creek with Ardeth would know. Putting himself on the bike path, we thought was enough for him to be charged. That was that, that link we were looking for, was him putting himself there. From what you told us today, OK, there's absolutely no doubt in mind, obviously, you are responsible for physically causing the death of Ardeth Wood, OK? On, August the 6th, 2003. Obviously, it's, I'm obliged to tell you that you're going to be charged with physically causing her death, OK? Do you understand that? We don't know what he said to get her to go down that path. We'll never know that. That's the big question. My feeling is that he meant to sexually assault her and that it went bad. He gets her down the path, and he gets her clothes off. And Ardeth's a very good swimmer. And we believe that her avenue escape is Green's Creek. And we believe she jumped in the water to get away. And we believe he just jumped in after and ended up drowning her. <laughs> 